Matthew chapter 9. All right, I want, I want you to take out a pen or phone or whatever it is you take notes on. Take that out right now. I'm going to ask you to do something hard. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to think about something, and I'm going to ask you to give an answer to yourself. But I actually genuinely want you to think about it, okay? I want you to think about, this is the, the last Sunday of the year, so this is like the Sunday every church stops and thinks about what happened and where we're going, right? So I want you to think back on 2019. This may be very hard for you. And I want you to think about what your goals were for this year as you came into this time last year. And then think about what actually happened. Think about what happened in 2019. And I want you to write down a number, one being the worst, 10 being the best. How good of a year was 2019? Okay, I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about it. You assess 360 plus days of life. And you gotta take into all things into consideration. You gotta take into all the external trials that you face. You gotta take in the promotions and the blessings and personal health. And so scale of one to 10. One being the worst, 10 being the best. How good of a year was 2019? Does anybody need more time? You wanna write? Okay. So I'm, I'm trusting you, trusting you that you thought about this seriously for 10 seconds, okay? Is there anybody in the room that was a 10? Anybody in the room that was a 10? 10. The worst. No, 10 is the best. One being the worst, 10 being the best. Is there anyone that was a 10? Okay, we got a 10 in the back row. For the rest of us who are not Jesus. <laughs> Joel, I'm just kidding, bro. I bet you, I bet you by the end of this sermon, Joel's going to be feeling pretty good about himself because I think I know why he put himself down as a 10. So, how did you grade it? That's the, how did you discern what your number was? How did, you, how did you come up with what a good year was for you? What makes a year good for you? So if you don't have a standard to go by or if it's kind of a fluctuating, we could come up with all sorts of numbers, right? Did you make more money? Did you get a better job? Did you move to a better neighborhood? Did something amazing happen to you in this year? Did you get cancer? Did you have a trial? Did you lose someone that you loved? All of these things come into play as you assess what made this year a good year or a bad year. And what I want to submit to us this morning as we begin is that for the Christian, there is a different scale than the world's for how we assess whether it was a good year or a bad year. I want to just read. It's not even our passage for today. This is a freebie from Philippians chapter 3. I want to read this perspective that the Apostle Paul has. He says this, But whatever gain I had, awesome year, right? Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. There is a principle in here for the Christian that's going to be teased out today in our sermon. And the principle for the Christian is both paradoxical and profound. Here it is. In order to live, we must die. In order to live, we must die. Jesus says, in Luke, whoever would follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross. He says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will save it. It's a paradox. It's profound. He says in John 12, unless the seed goes into the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. But if the seed goes into the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. In order to live, we must die. That is the life of Jesus. 
That's the life of Jesus. Jesus died for us. Jesus gave himself up for us. He gave up his life for our salvation. He died so that we would have life and we give our lives up in order to get true life. That is all backdrop to what we're going to look at at Matthew 9 this morning. Because if you're like me, and most of us are, with the rare exception in this room of Joel, we're less than tens. And even Joel, I know him, and, and I, know, I know this is true about him, even Joel in the back row would say that even as a 10 is a great year, there's so much more of God for him to experience, so much more of God for him to know. We're going to look this morning at the idea of fasting, everyone's favorite topic. Right? Fasting at the end of the year, right? So we've got the picture of the bread and the mayonnaise, and you're like, I am good to go. If that's what it means, then I'm skipping that, then I'm good. But we're going to look at fasting. Fasting is this idea, this, this, this decision of giving up something good. Giving up something good. We're going to talk about fasting from Matthew 9 as we exit 2019, and we begin 2020, we're going to talk about giving up something good. Now, I realize that that sounds very un-American to us, right? What do you mean giving up something good? That's what we're striving for. We're striving for something good, right? That's our, in our consumer-based world, we want to get as much good as we can. It feels un-American to talk this way. But what I want us to know and see from the Word of God this morning is that we were made for more. We were made for more than what we've gotten already. We were made for more than what we've gotten, from what we've received. And fasting, fasting in faith, in the sufficiency of God, increases our longing for God so that it reorients our entire scale and all of us can be tense. Fasting in faith towards God reorients the entire scale so that we find his sufficiency in all of our circumstances so that by the end of the year we can say in truth that in Christ it was a great year because neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God. No suffering, no pain can separate us from the love of God. In fact, the way of Jesus is to die and rise again. And so if we experience death, if you experience death in 2019, then the way of Jesus is to go down with him into that death, not avoid it, not shirk it, not go to the side of it, but to go down into that death with Jesus so that you too would experience the power of his resurrection life. You really can't go around if you're a Christian, fasting in faith increases our longing for God because it casts ourselves more fully on Him and our dependency on Him to sustain us. And we're going to see that from Matthew chapter 9. So if you could look at Matthew 9, verse 9, I'm going to read this section. I'm not going to speak on every single part equally today, but let's read through it for context and then we're going to look at what it says about, about fasting. Matthew 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn? as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed, but new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved." 
Let's pray together. Father, would you give us the grace to hear this word this morning? And Lord, would you awaken our hearts? Lord, would you make us alive? Would you cause revival in our hearts for you? Lord, we want more of you. And not just on a scale of one to 10, we want to be sustained by you. We want next year, 2020, to, to be a testimony and a demonstration of your awesome, sustaining power in whatever we face. Lord, we pray that you would give us that grace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I read a book a number of years ago uh, called A Hunger for God by John Piper. There's going to be a number of quotes from that book in this sermon. If you go and read that book and you think, hey, that sounds an awful lot like what Chris was saying in the sermon, it's because I got a lot of my thinking from that book. And it stuck with me over the years. And as I've come into this season of, of life, I found my own soul dry. My own soul dry for Jesus. And that's not because I haven't put my eyes to the word. It's not because I haven't tried my best in the spirit of God to obey. It's just that there are seasons of life that are dry. There are seasons of life that, that come and we need to be refreshed and we need to be renewed. And that's what Christian, Christian fasting does. I want to begin with what Christian fasting isn't, just so we're clear up front, because there's a number of things in this text, I think, that can guard us from some of the dangers. And there are a lot of dangers in talking about this. But we, we find Jesus in a classically awkward spot here in Matthew chapter 9. He's, he's gathering his original disciples in the gospel. He gathers Matthew, who's a tax collector. Matthew's the one who wrote this gospel. And he begins eating and drinking. He begins, he begins feasting with tax collectors and sinners. And you've got this group of people called the Pharisees. And they're the, the super religious people. They're the ones that are trying to keep every law. To the, and, and more than that, just to be, to be seen as righteous. And they have a problem with Jesus because they would never do this. Eating with people who are less than you in this culture and even in our culture, it's kind of irreligious. They would never do this. And they don't have the courage to go ask Jesus directly, so they bug, they bug his disciples. Why does your teacher do this? Why does he eat with tax collectors and with sinners? Why does he feast this way? John's disciples, they don't lack the same boldness. They come to Jesus in verse 14. And instead of asking, why does Jesus eat and drink with the sinners? They ask, why Jesus don't you fast? Why don't you fast like we do? Why do, why do we and the Pharisees fast, verse 14, but your disciples don't fast? So I want you to see something here from the beginning that I think by locking arms with the Pharisees, these disciples of John, who later on become disciples of Jesus, I think they're kind of coming at this self-righteously. Like, why don't you, if you're, so, if you're so great, if you're this great rabbi, why don't you do things in order the way that we do them? And Jesus says to them, you know, this fascinating response. If you're so godly, why aren't you fasting like us? And Jesus responds to them with a question of his own. Great method, right? You get asked a question, you ask a question back. And he says this. Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? See, one thing that fasting is not, is fasting is not supposed to be something of boasting. Like, I'm a great person because I'm doing these things. I'm, I'm giving these things up. The Pharisees we find in Luke chapter 18 thought of it as their external religion. They, you know maybe the story of the Pharisee and the publican in chapter 18. And the Pharisee says this. Listen to what he says. He stands by himself. He prays to God. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Look at me. Yippee, you know, how great am I? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Look at all the good that I'm doing. And he's trying to justify himself in the sight of God by his works. Fasting is not grounds for boasting. It's not meant to be. In fact, in the prophet Isaiah, we heard this morning already read to us that God condemns this kind of fast. God hates this kind of fast. God's not impressed with this kind of fast. He's not impressed with us, you know, boasting about the things that we do. 
So fasting is not for personal boasting. And then Jesus answers and says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? So fasting in this culture was an external sign of mourning. Now, I realize I'm sort of betraying my, my cause here because I'm, I'm wearing all black today. <laughs> and I didn't even realize that as I'm going to do this message. So we normally, we dress ourselves in black, right, for mourning, typically. It's a cultural thing. And, and yet in their culture, they fasted when they were mourning. It's usually associated with someone's death. And Jesus says this, and you need to get this because this is the key to this text. He says, you're not in the presence of a funeral. You're in the presence of a wedding, it's the day of a great wedding. The bridegroom is here at long last to marry his bride. The longing that we've been thinking about for Advent, right? Weeks leading up to the one who's come is now turned into celebration. What happens at a wedding, right? You're on a diet, you've got this strict diet, and then the wedding comes and you're like, forget it, right? I'm throwing the diet out the window because it's a wedding, it's a celebration. And you give yourself permission to eat whatever you want. You eat and drink out of joy because of the joy of the celebration. Well, in this case, the long-awaited Messiah has finally come to rescue his people. But then Jesus says something that's even more incredible than this. Verse 15, he says, The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Okay, so here's the picture. Here's the picture. The wedding ceremony has begun. But the ceremony's been cut short. The bridegroom has to go away. The bridegroom says, I'm going to return. There'll be celebration when I come back. Now, I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm going to point out now two other people in the congregation on this Sunday. It was a year ago yesterday that JJ and Courtney Self got married. And are they here today at all? They're right there. So they celebrate their one-year anniversary last year. That was not enthusiastic enough, people. All right? If you're going to clap. I say go, you know, go hard or go home. If you're going to clap, clap, right? If you're going to sing, sing. If we're going to preach, preach. Let's do it. So Courtney and JJ got married a year ago, and uh, I was there. I officiated the wedding. So I remember the moment, right? So JJ's up here, and everyone's in the crowd, and then Courtney walks down the aisle, and JJ's stoked, right? And she's stoked. So can you imagine Courtney walking down the aisle and getting to the very front, right in the spot, ready to be married, ready to start her new life with JJ self? And then JJ gets a phone call. Bring! Urgent phone call. I've got to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to come back. Can you imagine what would happen? Courtney, could you imagine what would have happened? <laughs> and she's left there waiting for him to return. <laughs> Checking her watch. Like, when, when's he coming back from this urgent phone call? That's not a good way to start a marriage, just in case any of you were wondering. But that's the picture here. Jesus is saying there's a wedding that started. There's a celebration that's begun. But then... I'm going to go away. This is an obvious reference, if you read the whole Gospels, to the cross where Jesus, the bridegroom, will die for his bride. It's interesting that this word for bridegroom, the only other time it's used in the Gospel of Matthew is in chapter 25. And in chapter 25, in the context, it's talking about his return. So the bridegroom is here. The bridegroom will return. He says... In chapter 25, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. It's this idea of waiting and longing for what's going to happen. And then in Revelation 19, there is a celebration that happens because when the bridegroom comes, he's prepared this feast. So in Revelation 19, it says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints, verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The bridegroom comes 
with celebration, first coming. The bridegroom will return with celebration. And in between the first and second coming, there will be a fast. So this is actually the way that the New Testament describes the entire church age. Fasting. Longing. It's not the fast that John's disciples are thinking about. It's a new kind of fast altogether. Not one in mourning, but one in longing, waiting, longing. He tells us this through this weird metaphor where he talks about an unshrunk patch on an old garment. He talks about how if you try to put the old with the new, it'll pull. It'll make a worse tear. Or if you put the old wineskin and new in it, it, the wineskin becomes brittle and it will just crack and break. Only a new wineskin can hold new wine. And so he's saying this is a new kind of fast in the entirety of the church age. It's meant to be this, this, this is what Christian fasting is now. It's meant to be a longing for what we were made for. A longing for God. A longing for what we were made for. Not a fast of mourning, but a fast of longing. Longing for what is to come. Longing for the joy of the return. Longing for the consummation of the wedding. Longing for the marriage supper. Longing for God. We live in that age right now between the promise of the marriage and the consummation of the marriage to the bridegroom and God has created us to long for what is to come. That's true in everyday life, right? We long for a spouse. We long for healing. We long for a dream to be fulfilled. We long for a desire to be satisfied. We long to be understood. We long to be loved. We long, we long, we long. Can you say this morning... Can you say this morning that your heart is longing for the Lord? Longing for the Lord. Not just just his gifts, not just his benefits, not just his blessings, but with him, the fullness of him, his presence, to have him with you, to return, to be with God, to be done with sin, to be in God's presence evermore. Are you longing for this reality that the gospel brings us? If not, you're probably less than a 10. Because as you know, as well as I do, that the best laid plans and hopes and dreams that we want to see accomplished on this earth rarely come to pass the way that we think they should. If you set your hope, if you set your longing on something of this earth and you bank on it and you put everything into it, it rarely, rarely satisfies us the way we think it's going to. See, the cry of the early church, the cry of the early church was Maranatha. It was come Lord Jesus, right? So Jesus has already come and they're waiting and their cry is come Lord Jesus, come. And I want us to develop that heart this morning. That as we close 2019 and all of the joy that we want to see spread through treasuring Christ in all of life in 2020, that we don't miss while we're spreading this joy, we don't miss that this joy is is actually vertical as well as horizontal, and we don't miss that this joy is eternal and not just temporal, that we would long for Jesus to come and make the world back to the way it should be. And that is the hope of the New Testament. If you've read the Bible year to year, if, if you read the Bible this year, you got your, get your reading plans going to hope you've got some plan of some kind or you've got some pathway to get the word in, inside of you. When you get to the New Testament and you read, what is the hope of the church in the New Testament? It is not political, you know, peace. It's not that wars will cease on this earth. It is clear. It is a hope that's built on Christ and his coming. I'm just going to read a few verses fairly quickly just so that you can kind of see a scattering of this hope. In Luke 12, he says, Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. That's like the other verse, right? And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. Hebrews 9 says, And just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that come judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. See that? 
Titus 2, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, which is what? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 2 Timothy 4, last one, verse 8, henceforth, this is the last letter Paul writes. This is the last chapter of the last letter that Paul writes. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Lo waiting, eagerly waiting, longing. See, Christianity without Christ's presence, Christianity without Christ's promised return, is like an engagement without a wedding. It makes no sense. It makes the heart sick. But the reality is we've been betrothed to the bridegroom and we are waiting and longing and anticipating the wedding feast. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Is that the cry of your heart this morning? You who are tired, you who are lonely, you who are successful, you who are prosperous, you who are hungering for God. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hunger for his return, thirsting for his presence. The key ingredient that turns religion into revival is a spirit driven hunger for God. It's a spirit born desire inside your heart to want God. Apart from God working in our hearts, we don't want God. It is a spirit born desire in your heart to want Him above all things and to want Him in all things and through all things and to want to please God in your thoughts and in your decisions. And if you don't have that, you can get it. So here's a quote from. John Piper. In other words, he says, in this age, there is an ache inside every Christian that Jesus is not here as fully and intimately and as powerfully and as gloriously as we want him to be. We hunger for so much more. That's why we fast. Sometimes you must give up what is good in order to get what is even better. Now, obviously in the Bible, we're talking about food, right? We're talking about food. So here's the way it works. Food, a gift from God. God created us to require food in order to live. He made it so that we would long for food in the very gift he would provide. So food is good. Food is for God's glory. We know this from 1 Corinthians 10. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And most of the time, we glorify God by eating the food. We eat the, the bread with the mayonnaise on it. We say, praise be to God, right? Most of the time we eat the food. We give a thankful heart. But we can also glorify God through faith-filled abstaining. And that's what's stirring my heart up as of late. Because sometimes to get what is better, we must give up what is good. And sometimes to know the love of Christ in a better spirit deeper way is to spark a kind of spiritual hunger that only God can satisfy. There might be something in your life that's choking out this hunger. You know, it's the way that food works, right? Like you can eat and eat and eat, and sadly I'm guilty of this way too many times, and eat and eat and eat and eat, and you go to bed so full and your stomach hurts you all night long. What's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? You eat again. You're not even hungry. You eat and you eat and you eat and you eat and you just bloat and you just feel bloated and just don't have, and you're not even satisfied. And what needs to happen, what your doctor will tell you and what your doctor told me in October <laughs> was, and, and they'll use different words in this, right? But basically, you need to stop eating so much and you need to start exercising. Maybe they'll just say it to you that directly, right? You need to stop eating so much and you need to start exercising. Because there's this principle physically that just because you can eat doesn't mean that you should eat, right? Sometimes you need to actually cut back on some of that in order to gain something better called health, right? Same thing's true spiritually. Sometimes you need to cut some things out of your life that are good, good things, so that you can start to hunger and thirst again for the best things, Christ. 
And while the examples in the Bible of fasting usually revolve around abstaining from food, the heart of fasting is not exclusively about food per se. It is about being a sold out, spirit empowered disciple of Jesus. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, fasting, if we conceive of it truly, must not be confined to the question of food and drink. Fasting should really be made to include abstinence from anything that is legitimate in and of itself for the sake of some special spiritual purpose. There are many bodily functions which are right and normal and perfectly legitimate, but for which spe special particular reasons in certain circumstances should be controlled. That is fasting. So it is a temporary laying down of what is good to get something that's eternally better. To give, give up something good out of a hunger for something better. And so while the driving topic here in Matthew 9 is food, fasting can consist of anything that is voluntarily laid aside for a spiritual gain. John Piper says again, fasting is not a no to the goodness of food or the generosity of God in providing it. Rather, it is a way of saying from time to time that having more of the giver surpasses the gifts. Which means that bread magnifies Christ in two ways. By being eaten with gratitude for his goodness and by being forfeited out of a hunger for God himself. When we eat, we taste the emblem of our heavenly food, the bread of life. And when we fast, we're saying, I love the reality above the emblem. In the heart of the saint, both eating and fasting are worship. Both magnify Christ. Both send the heart, grateful and yearning to the giver. Each has its appointed place and each has its danger. The danger of eating is that we fall in love with the gift. The danger of fasting is that we belittle the gift and glory in our willpower. The danger of eating is that we fall in love with the gift. I don't know for you what it is that you've fallen in love with that's legitimate and good and should be received with thanksgiving and joy, but is skewing your view of God or is taking your, your hope away from God or is subtly moving you away from, from dependency on God. And I want us, I want, and I'm, I'm putting myself at the front of this list, I want personally to experience the goodness of God in my life. I want that, that experience to grow. And I want you to experience the goodness of God. And I want you who, who are dry in your soul as the end of the year come, I want, I want God to create a thirst in you. I want us all to declare our confidence in God's ability to sustain us. We can do without things that most generations never had before us. Do you realize that? Like, like not even a hundred years ago, no phones, no TVs, no internet, right? I want us to declare our confidence in God to sustain us. I want us to be, I want us to weaken our reliance on the created to strengthen our reliance on the creator. I believe if we do that, it will undercut the roots of idolatry. Where we turn to for hope, open the fridge door, grab something out because we're just longing for something that God should be satisfying, but we go to food. I want God to give us supernatural strength in breaking patterns of sin. I want God to give wisdom for making important decisions. I want God to draw near to us in 2020 by his spirit. Do you want these things as well? Do you, do you personally long for these things? If you don't, John Piper says, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there is no room for the great. God did not create you for this. There is an appetite for God and it can be awakened. I want us to be awakened as we turn the year. Now, there is a danger to preaching this. There is a danger to doing this. And I can imagine as you're sitting here, you're, maybe you have some walls that are going up and you're like, you're not touching that. <laughs> not, but you're not gonna get to that, that spot. There's some dangers in this and I just wanna call them out. Let's just call them for what they are, okay? Danger number one is doing this because the leadership of the church told you to do it. Danger number one. That's legalism, that's hypocrisy, that's vanity, Matthew 15, when, when, when Jesus says, you hypocrites, 
Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So if you just do it because you're like, I don't want the pastor to get mad at me, or I just want to look good for the church, you're doing it wrong. There's a danger there. Danger two, you do it because you feel obligated or you feel guilty. Well, Hebrews says that this is really about faith. Hebrews 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that this is just an obligation. No, wait, that's not what it says. It must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's the heart of faith in fasting. There's a danger in doing this because it might tempt you to think that God will love you more. Like we already read in Luke, right? I thank God that I fast twice a week. God should love me more. No, he doesn't. And he won't. He loves you because of Christ. There's a danger in doing this in the, in the, in the self-will power. You know, your own power which cultivates pride, which feeds the flesh. And Colossians 2 talks about this. He talks about submitting to regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are no value of stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So these are dangers, right? And I, I want to invite you to hear this today, not as an obligation, but as an opportunity to draw near to God by faith, by giving up something to get more. Not as an obligation. So there's dangers in doing it, but there's also dangers in not doing it. There's dangers in hearing, but not hungering. And receiving, but not responding. There's a danger to fail to confront idolatry and fasting tests where our hearts really are. Do we trust in God or do we trust in bread with mayonnaise on it? Do we trust in coffee? Do we trust in ice cream before you go to bed at night? Do you trust in chocolate? Do you trust in wine or beer? Do you trust in television? Do you trust Netflix, Hulu, Apple TV, Spotify, and any of the other myriad of apps? Do you trust in new clothes? Do you trust in video games? Piper again. One might think that those who feast most often on communion with God are least hungry. That's how we think, right? We eat food. Oh, I'm so full, right? One might think that those who feast most often on communion with God are least hungry. They turn often from the innocent pleasures of the world to linger more directly in the presence of God through the revelation of his word. And there, there, they eat the bread of heaven and drink the living water by meditation and faith. But paradoxically, it is not so that they are the least hungry saints. The opposite is the case. The strongest, most mature Christians I have ever met are the hungriest for God. It might not seem to those who eat that those who eat most would be least hungry, but that's not the way it works with an inexhaustible fountain, an infinite feast, and a glorious Lord. So what does this look like for us as we kind of land the plane? What does this look like for you? I'm going to give you some, some things to think through, but specifically, it's up to you. It's up to you and the Lord. I have no idea what will help you hunger after God more. I really don't. I barely have an idea what would help me. I'm just trying to figure it out. But it's probably a combination of ways. I could say in general, I think it's this. It's giving up something to get more. Giving up something and replacing it with something to get more. So here's some examples. They're just examples that might help you begin formulating your plan if by faith in Christ you want to do this in the beginning of this year. Here's some examples. You could skip or replace a daily meal. Replace it with prayer. Don't eat. Give up something good. Get something better. Feast on Christ. Pray. You could skip a particular food or drink that you regularly eat, some, some kind of reward that you give yourself, and you could replace it with the reward of the scriptures and the reward of God's presence. You could use it as a time to memorize scripture. If you didn't see already, the church, Grace Church, is giving a three-month subscription to start to this, to this app called Dwell. It's a Bible memorization app and a Bible app that, that speaks the word of God to you. It's a beautiful app. 
you can download it. Uh, you should have got an email if you're a member about it. But you could skip something and you could try to memorize some passage of Scripture. How long has it been since you've tried to memorize Scripture? That could be a great way to start the new year. You could abstain from some entertainment or social media and replace it with reading. What books are on your reading list for this year or audiobooks to listen to? You could shut down social media for a while, give your mind a break. You could stop doing video games for a while and give yourself to exercise and prayer. I don't know what it looks like for you and some of you have health issues in your life and you shouldn't fast from food. I am not a doctor. I don't even play a medical doctor on TV. I have no idea if you should do that or not. So don't, don't go do something like that and then without talking to your doctor and then say, Chris told me to do it and you know, blame me. I don't want that to happen. Because food is not the issue. Legalism is not the issue. It's not the goal to be legalistic. God is the goal. We're choosing to give up something good in order to get more of God. And so in general, here's my proposition for us as a church. We did this seven years ago, and I want us to do it again this year, if you're willing. Two kinds of fasts. First would be a, a four-day fast that starts on Wednesday, the beginning of the year, January 1st, and goes through to Sunday. This would be a more intense fast where there's something you give up to jumpstart you into this next year of longing for Christ. So that's the short fast. And then the longer fast would be a month, the month of January, that there's something from the month of January that you decide as you think and you pray and you talk with your family and friends and your community group, maybe your parents, you talk with your kids. Maybe there's something even as a family that you could do to purposely set aside something good in order to get something better as a family. Maybe it's the very thing you need to do to jumpstart your marriage. Maybe it's the very thing you need to do to jumpstart in your parenting. And we're going to do a month-long fast over the course of January. And then at the end of January, we're going to celebrate. And our community groups tell the stories of what God's done. As a church, we can celebrate God's being with us. And we don't have to let it end. Because the church fast is from the first coming to the second coming. So whatever God puts on your heart, you could continue to do. Coming to communion now as we come to the, <laughs> to the wedding feast, we have this interesting spiritual picture here in bread and cup. So it's through death that we get life. It's through the broken body of Jesus's, Jesus on the cross and his shed blood on the cross that as he dies, we find life. And it's through this life in Christ that faith arises in us. And without the exercise of faith towards God, listen, fasting is useless. Don't even bother trying if it's not done faith-filled towards God. It will actually do more harm than good. But if you are in Christ, he's yours. And you can take this bread and you can take this cup and you can say, he is my life. As I eat this bread and I drink this cup, I'm dying to myself in him. And I want to live in him. I can face whatever comes my way in 2020, the sufferings and the trials in Christ. If, that, if that's you and you can say that, then as we eat this bread and this cup, we begin a fast and a feast. Feasting on Jesus, fasting from the world. So let's pray and let's begin this time of communion as we close our service. Father, we pray that you would speak to us. Even now, Lord, what, what, what we should do in response to who you are so that we would have more of you, Lord. Lord, guard us from any workspace mentality that if we you know, give everything, then you're gonna love us more. No, Lord, help us to just say, I wanna put aside the cotton candy of the world that stuffs us and makes us sick. And I want true food. I want you, Lord. Revive our souls this morning in the taking of the bread and the cup. In Jesus' name, amen.